In today's video, I'm going to be making some pretty drastic changes to my home network cabinet. In particular, changes related to how it's mounted on the wall. When I put this up way back at the end of 2017, I just used these Grip-It plasterboard fixings. And to be honest, they've actually been perfectly fine. And they are really strong fixings, I use them for a couple of TVs and stuff and I've never had an issue with them. However, there is just always the fear of these failing. I never really thought about when I put it up, but after putting this up, I've now just always got that constant worry in the back of my mind that one day I'm going to hear a crash and find this hanging off the wall. And in particular, that crops up any time I put anything in it. For example, when I upgraded to the UDM, I was constantly worried that I'd put something a bit heavier and bigger in the cabinet and I was like, one day this is going to come off the wall. When I lay things on top, just because it's got a bit of space up there to store things, when I put things on top, I'm always worrying, is that going to pull it off the wall? To the extent that I've actually now run a chain that goes around the top of the cabinet, up into the ceiling and goes around a ceiling tie that I could access, just in the hope that if it did fall off the wall, the chain would at least catch it before it ripped all the cables down. So yeah, I do need to find a better way to mount this. And, you know, one, it needs to be done one day, so I may as well do it. Now, when I put this up with these, a lot of people at first were like, why are you doing that? Just screw some, pl some plywood across the studs and screw into the plywood. But it's a classic thing of people commenting on a YouTube video without actually being in the property and seeing how it's constructed. This wall, on the wall that this is mounted to, there is actually only one accessible stud, and it's where that fire extinguisher is, it's the fire extinguisher is mounted to it. There's no stud on the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the wall, which is weird, and in hindsight that makes me even more nervous that this is mounted to the plasterboard because the plasterboard doesn't seem to be screwed up very securely. In fact, if you go onto the wall on that corner there and push on the back wall hard enough, you actually see a little crack in the paint where the two walls join. So I don't think it's really securely mounted at all at either, at either side, which isn't very good. So I can't just screw onto that wall because there's only the one stud. The only way I could really do it would be if I screwed into like the top plate of the wall, but that's still not ideal, it's a bit too close to the ceiling. So for years, I've just not known how to do it. But recently I came, came across some, some material, a, a metalwork system that I found that will actually be ideal for this. So we'll take a look at that. So yeah, the plan will be to take this all off the wall, mount the new metal framework I'll be mounting it to that we'll take a look at, and get it on a lot more securely. Because even though there isn't a stud on this back wall, there is a stud on the right hand side wall and the left hand side wall right towards the back that I can mount into. So with the new system I will be able to mount it securely. Additionally in the process I'll be replacing the patch panel. I'll go into more detail around that later but essentially I need to take this patch panel out anyway and unterminate it all to get the cabinet down. So I'll be replacing it with a new patch panel with keystone jacks so it'll be easier to take out in the future because while I've not got immediate plans to replace this cabinet it is something that in the future I could maybe see happening down the line just to get one that's a bit deeper or larger or whatever. So if I'm taking the patch panel out now anyway, I may as well take it this as an opportunity to fit one that'll be easier to remove in the future. So we'll be doing that as well. So yeah, it's been a pretty drastic project and I'm hoping it doesn't take too long because I'm going to be without network while I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, time to go and take a look at the hardware we'll be installing and how we'll be mounting this. And then time to do the terrifying thing of ripping it all out and hopefully getting it all back in. So now here we have the system I'm going to be using. And this is why it's taken me so long to do it, because I just didn't know about the existence of this, so I didn't know it was an option to, do, to use. And this is a system that's often called Unistrut. Unistrut's actually a brand name, it's a bit like Hoover being a generic trademark, so this isn't actually made by Unistrut, but it's a compatible system. I bought this from a company called Direct Channel in the UK, not a sponsor or anything, but they were really good. They just seemed a bit cheaper than a lot of other places, and also the good thing with them is they sold one metre lengths, most places as standard sell three meter lengths. So even though I had to probably pay a bit more to get a two one meter lens rather than a single three meter length, it at least is a lot easier to deal with much shorter lens. Like if I had a three meter length, I don't even know how to get it in the door, let alone cut it up. So that's why I bought that. But what Unistrut or you know this sort of system is, is it's a system designed to make big strong metal frameworks without having to weld. So they sell all these different pieces, including all the metal struts, all the fixings we'll use, and in loads of different angle brackets. So you can join huge, huge lengths of these together and build really strong structures. It's very common in a lot of commercial places. You'll see it out if you're in like a big sort of warehouse type shop or whatever. They'll use it for things like the cable trays. They'll use it for holding up racking. You can even probably build, you know, load bearing structures with it. It is a very, very strong material. Now I'm not remotely using it to its full potential here, but because it's so versatile, it's easy to cut down. It's easy to install brackets. It's easy to make anything you want out of it it's ideal for this particular job. It has a couple of key components. The main thing is you've got the channel here. 
And this is a 41 by 41 mil metal, well, steel channel. It's 2.1 mil thick. It's really heavy duty. And it's got this sort of lip. So it's a sort of U shape and it's got this sort of lip on the end here. And what you then get is these spring nuts. These are, in the UK, they're often called Zebedee nuts, named after a Magic Roundabout kids TV show character. So I don't know how widespread worldwide that terminology is, but it's just a little nut with a spring on the bottom with these sort of serrated bits here. And what you do with these is you take it, you put it into the channel and you sort of push it down into the channel and then rotate it round. And when you rotate it into the channel, that then pops up and presses against the inside of it and stays in place. And then when you tighten the, nu the nut into it, because it's got that serrated bit, these serrated pieces on the top, oh, it's stuck. Yeah, these serrated pieces here bite into the channel and stop it sliding. So even if you've got one of these mounted vertically, it won't actually slide down under the weight of gravity. It's a really simple system, but it's really strong. And if anyone needs any of these, I've now got a box of 100 because they only sold boxes of 100 and I needed eight. So I might, I might do more projects with this in the future, given I've got so many of these now. But yeah, that's what you do to mount all these together. You use these little spring nuts, screw them into the channel and screw into them. To fix it all together, you've then got all sorts of angle brackets. Now, I'm not going to be mounting any of these struts together. I'm just going to mount them onto the, into the studs. But you'd use the same brackets. So I've got these angle pieces here. And what I'll be doing is I'll be mounting these into that wall on the side. So the wall will be here and that'll be screwed into the stud. This will stick out and I can then hook the channel in behind it and screw the channel in. So what will ultimately happen is I'll have a Zebedee nut in the corner here. And then I'll be mounting that over it like that, screwing through into the Zebedee nut and that'll be screwed onto the wall. And I'll just have two lengths of this channel going across the wall and then I'll mount the cabinet into four of these ebony nuts mounted wherever the cabinet's going to go. So I'm not really using it to its full potential, but you can see with this how easy it would be to build a huge structure because you get, you know, angle pieces like this, you get straight pieces, you get pieces that are like actually like, you know, 45 degree angles to do weird angled stuff. You get offset ones to like layer struts on top of each other. It's a super versatile system. So yeah, that's what we're going to be using. So I've got these two lengths, which I'll just need to cut down to the exact width of, width of the cupboard. Mount these on the wall with a, couple, a few big carriage bolts and then get the struts mounted. Additionally, I also mentioned I'm going to be replacing my patch panel. That's because my current patch panel, while it works absolutely fine, is just a standard basic type, which just has a bunch of IDC connections on the back for all the, for all the 24 RJ45 ports and the cables are just punched down directly onto it. That's absolutely fine, and those patch panels are super common. They're probably one of the more common types you'll see just because of their low cost and ease of installation. However, because all the cables are directly punched down onto the patch panel, in order to take the cabinet down, I'm going to have to disconnect all of them because I can't fit that whole patch panel out the hole in the top of the cabinet. It's not, it's big enough to fit the cables out, but not big enough to fit a patch panel through. Now, if I was just taking this down, putting it back up and knew for a fact that I was never going to take it down again, I'd probably just re-terminate it back into the same patch panel because it works fine. But because there's a chance I might want to take it down in the future to either put a bigger cabinet in or just whatever, I wanted to do something a bit different. So I've decided to replace that patch panel with this setup here. This is a slightly more fancy type of patch panel called a keystone patch panel. I don't know if they're more common in the US because I think a lot of U the US key keystone jacks are really common where in the UK we tend to use Euro, Euro modules. But if you open this up, what you'll see is it's a patch panel, but it's totally empty. You know, there's no modules in it. This is from Connectix as the brand, it's Connectix Cable Systems. I've used a lot of Excel products, that's generally what I go to, but I've seen a lot of Connectix used in the field, so I wanted to try it out and it seems pretty decent. So this is the patch panel I've got and it's a totally unloaded 48 port frame. And this will take Keystone modules. So if you look in these boxes here, we've got some modules. So they're very similar to the Keystone modules I've used in all my network points, just a different brand, but they're just Cat6 Keystone modules and they're toolless. So you open them up, you put this little plug in the back, you pull that out, you stick your wire through there and stick all the wires into the guide, clip it in, shut it, and then click it shut and it all works. And that then gives you all of these RG45 keystone modules. And then these modules, once they're clicked together, will then clip into the patch panel. So take it like that, put it in, and it'll then, with a bit of force, there you go, click into place. And this is why I've had this idea because if I ever need to take this patch panel out in the future, I no longer need to remove, like, unterminate all the wires. I can just go in, unclick all of these keystone modules. I'll probably need a screwdriver to do it. Probably won't be able to do it with a bare hand. No. 
but I can quite easily unclick all these keystone modules and I'll end up with just a bunch of wires with the keystone modules on the end. And those will be small enough to pull out of the top of the cabinet. So I can take the patch panel out, unclick all the keystone modules and pull all the cables out rather than having to actually touch any of the terminations. The terminations can be left intact. I can just pull them out. So that seems a lot simpler. So yep, I've got 24 of these keystone modules. I'll only need 23, but I think I might need the next one in the future. So I've bought a spare. And then I've also bought this one here because with my current wrap, with my current patch panel, I've run a phone extension up to allow my DSL connection and my modem to be plugged directly into the patch panel. But because it's a fixed patch panel, it's just an RJ45 port. So I've labelled it DSL and I use, an, a D, I use a RJ45 to RJ11 cable to connect my modem. And it works fine, but you know, that's prone to error. It's not intuitive. You might have someone go in the future and plug a switch into that and wonder why it's not working or whatever. So because it's a modular system, I've been able to buy different keystone modules. So here I've got another one. This is an RJ11 keystone module. So I'll be installing this one in the patch panel as well. And I'll be connecting the phone extension onto this. So when I connect my modem, I can just use a standard RJ11 modem lead, the one you'd get with it, to plug it into here. Now, I wouldn't recommend this particular module. It's, it was a cheap one on Amazon, but it's a bit wider than the standard Keystone module. I don't know why. So you see it's a lot wider than the Kinectix ones. And it means that if you want to install it into the patch panel, you can't fit this beside another module. So like it'll fit on its own, but it won't fit directly in next to one, which is a little bit annoying. So yeah, I mean, it'll work fine for my use because I'll just put it way over here. But yeah, I maybe wouldn't recommend this particular module. But with a Keystone patch panel, it gives you that flexibility. The other thing you'll notice is I've gone for a 48 port patch panel and a big bag of blanks when I only have 23 ports. So that seems a bit weird. But this is because I've had a bit of a weird idea and it's something I really want to try. I think I saw it on Reddit, on the Home Lab subreddit. Someone had done the same thing. I thought that is actually a bit unconventional but really neat. So with my typical pa my current patch panel and basically almost every patch panel, the ports run left to right and they're num numbered increasing from left to right. So you'd have basically port one on the left, port 24 on the right. However, if you look at a switch, well, most 24 port switches like mine, the ports are stacked. They don't run horizontally, they run, they're you know, double stacked and they're all over to one side of the switch. And with my current setup, that's not particularly neat. Because what you end up having is port one, the lower number of ports on the left hand side of the patch panel, the cables have to stretch quite far to reach the port on the switch. But as you get to the higher number of ports, because they're right above the switch, the cables have to stretch a lot less. And it means that on the left of the patch panel, the cables are really nicely sort of bent out at a decent length. But on the right hand side of the patch panel, the cables are all crammed in because they're not running really any distance and having to like loop over because there's loads of excess. And it makes for a pretty messy install. So my plan with this is to use these keystone modules, but instead of running them along and then along the next row, I'm going to double stack them. So I'll number them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And then the right hand side of this patch panel will mostly be blanked off apart from that DSL port. That then means that all the cables coming from the patch panel down to the switch will be roughly the same length, well, not all the same length, but they'll be stretched out roughly the same as each other because they're all going basically the same distance. And that will hopefully avoid all that messy bundle. So it's just something I want to try out. And the benefit is that even if I absolutely hate it and it just doesn't work, because these are keystone modules, I can easily go in, pop them out, arrange them differently. If I decide I don't want this 48 port patch panel, I can just buy the 24 port version, pop the keystones out and reclip them in. It would be really easy to swap out. But it's something that I've not really seen done before, apart from that one Reddit thread. And it does just seem like a really neat solution and might make it a bit more neat, more aesthetically pleasing and easier to work with. So I thought I may as well give that a go. So yeah, this is a new patch panel I'll be installing. So yeah, with all the hardware there, I think the next thing to do is just, well, take it all down and start working. So first thing I'm going to do is obviously just tip, turn it all off, pull all the equipment out, and then I'll pull the patch panel out. And what I'll then do is one by one, I'll disconnect one of the cables from the patch panel and wire it into a keystone jack and number it. So that even before I take the cabinet down, I'll just have all the cables terminated in the keystone jacks all numbered. And that'll make it a lot easier once I get the cabinet off the wall and want to re-terminate into this. So, yep, time to turn everything off and pull that patch panel out. It's been up there for a good few years now. So can I remember how to work on all that stuff? Sure, it'll be fine. But it's a bit intimidating ripping out work that's been working perfectly for years. It's almost a bit sad because it's been there for so long. But yeah, this will be a nice little upgrade.
Okay, so we've got a progress update. That's everything ripped out. So I've pulled all the kit out. It's all sitting piled up down there. And I've basically taken the patch panel out. So what I'll need to do here is you can see we've got this big bundle of cables that comes down through the ceiling as before, as it's done for years, and it all comes into the patch panel. What I'm going to do, because obviously all these are numbered and I need to keep the numbering matched up, one by one I'm going to take it out, terminate it into a keystone jack, and then stick a number on the keystone jack or something. So what I'll end up with is just no patch panel, and all these cables will still be inside the cabinet, but with keystone jacks on the end. And because the cabinet does have quite a large hole in the top, that'll be easy enough to get all the keystone jacks out once I take the cabinet down. I just can't obviously fit this entire thing out of that hole. So that's why I've had to, I'm to do this. So I won't film all of that just because it's just going to be a very boring time lapse of me doing the same thing over and over again and the camera and lights will just drive me mad. But what I'll probably do is I'll take a few out and once I'm sort of comfortable with those connectors, I'll pop in closer and just show how I've terminated one of them. A fairly, fairly easy things to do, but yep, yeah, time to one by one, take all these out and get the keystone jacks on. Okay, so just checking with the progress update. This has been going on for absolutely ages. It's just a really time consuming, repetitive process, but I'm getting there. So as you can see, I've got a lot of these cables now removed and they're terminated into the new keystone jacks. So see if I take one on there, you can see it's terminated into there. I've numbered it on the side just so I know which port it relates to. And then you put a zip tie around the back that secures it and that's what it says in the instructions for these keystone modules to do. And yeah, these toolless keystone modules are actually really good. They're so much more like, just so much quicker than trying to punch down onto these and just gives a much nicer finish, so I'm definitely very happy with these. It is a much more expensive way of doing it than using these punch down patch panels, but if I'm doing installs where the cost of a patch panel isn't really a big deal, I'll probably definitely start using these, because if you're doing a big install, 20 quid versus 40 quid for a patch panel doesn't make a big difference, so yeah, this does make it a lot nicer, so I'm dead happy with that. So I thought I'd quickly just show roughly what I'm doing, just I, I can't actually show it live on camera me doing it because I'm, you know, up a ladder and I, the, the camera can't reach up here, it's a bit of a nightmare, but what I've been doing is going along, cutting out the zip ties and then pulling all the wires out just using this hook on the end of the IDC tool and the wires come out and they come out sort of like this. And what's quite good is even though obviously the insulation is broken on the ends of them where they've been punched into the IDC terminals, maybe we'll see there, yeah there you go, um, the act, because these IDC terminals are quite far from the centre of the of the of where the cable comes in, there's quite a lot of slack already stripped off. Whereas these new connectors don't really need much slack at all. So I'm actually able to term, take these, sort of roughly straighten them out a bit and terminate them into the new jack so I haven't stripped the jacket back and cut the inner core out and stuff. So that's actually a lot, makes things a lot easier. So I'll sort of stop the video and jump in and show basically the process, but basically I'm taking these, straighten the wires out just to kind of get them roughly neater. Maintaining the twist where I can, but I mean, most basically almost all of this gets cut off, so the twists really only need to be maintained up to the end of the jacket anyway because they go as soon as they come out here, they go straight into terminations with these new connectors. But if you take one of the new connectors there, that's it there. Pop it open. And actually, the good thing with these connectics ones, it's just silly things. They come pre unclipped, so that makes life a lot easier. It's a bit like having pre backed out screws in a socket. And they come in a cardboard box. Whereas I bought the XL ones previously, they came in individual plastic bags and they were just an absolute nightmare to unpack them all, so that does make it a lot quicker. But yeah, you open it up, and in back here, if I can do it one-handed, just use that, there you go. And in the back, there's this little guide here. So what you need to do is take this little guide, feed the cable through the back here, then you kind of, yeah, so you feed the cable through the back of that guide, then round the front, you then want to pull all the wires over and bend them into the individual corresponding terminals there. And then you cut the excess off and punch it down. So what I'll do is I'll go off camera and I'll get the wires in place and then show you what we do next. Okay, so there we go. So that's the wires all now in. So basically put the cable through the back, get it so the insulation is right up to the inside of that, and then just basically bend all the individual wires over and put them into the guide. And it's all colour coded on the side there, so it's pretty easy. And once they're all pushed down into the guide, that's them all sitting in place. It's then a case of trying to do this one handed, it's a really stupid idea. Let's just put the camera down, but basically cutting off all the individual wires flush up the side and then you can put it in the connector so I'm going to do it off camera because that's going to be really fiddly to do with the camera in my hand but yeah basically cutting them all off flush with the edges and then you can just push it into the connector there you go so that's them all cut off flush and then all you need to do is match up the colour codes on the side of the connector versus this little plug thing and basically put them slide them into each other this is really silly to do one handy but we'll try um, there you go. 
So basically put that into there like that. See that sort of push it into the back. And then basically clip it in, apply a little bit of pressure, but you don't need to use much. Because if you then just fold over the wings and squeeze them, that's enough to put it all in and make the connection. So that's now pushed that little bit into the back of the connector, pierced the insulation on all the conductors, and that's now terminated. So that's pretty easy. So all I would need to do now is, just la is label that up with a number, and then I'm just testing it out. So I'm using that CCTV tester I did the video on previously, and doing a continuity and a TDR test of each conductor, or each cable, just to check it all. And they're all testing out fine. Touch wood, I've not had a single bad connection yet out of the first um, 15 or something I've done. Yeah, 15 and not a single issue, so these connectors do seem really reliable, which is good. So yeah, time to do the rest of them. This is taking an age. Okay, so here we have a progress update. So finally, I've been able to remove the old patch panel, so yep, that's it there. And I've got all the connections now re-terminated into keystones, so it's probably very loud. There's all 23 network runs are all now into these new keystone jacks. So that means when I take the cabinet off the wall, they can all feed out the hole on the top and I can get the cabinet out of the way, so that makes it a lot easier. And in the future, if I do the same again, take the cabinet down, it's just as easy to take them all out. So that's all 23 network runs there. And then here we've got the RG45, or sorry, RG11 DSL one. So that's just literally using one pair, just the blue pair, just to carry the DSL signal up to that. And while this probably looks really messy and people will be like, oh, what have you done? Oh. Um, the reason I've done this is because there's three other pairs there that I'm not currently using. If I did ever want to use an additional pair out of that cable, you know, they, they go down to the master socket. So it could be if I've wanted a analog phone extension, don't know why, but anyway. Um, I've left in there because I might want to have these additional pairs go to neighbouring jacks, you know, have the individual pairs out the wire come into neighbouring jacks on the patch panel. So that's why there's a bit of slack there and I've not cut them off just in case I did ever use them. I don't see myself ever doing that, but I don't know, there is a phone extension in the living room that's currently just wired off the master socket, but the temptation is to bring up the patch panel and, and I don't know. But yeah, that's the RJ, RJ11 connection for the modem, so it just uses one pair, so that's there. So that is basically all done. So the next thing is to get the cabinet out. The only other tricky thing we have right now is this PDU. Because when I installed the PDU, it, this is a fairly cheap one, it's not got a replaceable cable, it's just got a hardwired flex. So what I ended up doing was basically t taking it apart, wiring a new flex on inside it, mounting it in the cabinet, and then running the flex around the room, or around the cupboard, and when I got to the other end with a plug, I cut the flex to the right length and wired a plug on. So it means that essentially this is currently kind of wired through the cabinet. So what I'm going to do is I can actually, is it, even though it goes through this grommet at the back, the grommet is split, so I can actually get the cable out of this grommet. It's not, it wasn't fed through there and then wired in, so that's easy enough to do. So what I've got is I've got some inline 16 amp connectors. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this flex and wire that on. So essentially I'll have a connector in the middle here that I can easily unplug to separate the two, or I can put them back in and connect the two. So that'll do, it, it just means I don't need to take the PDU apart to remove the flex. And it means in the future it's easy enough to remove. I think eventually I'll probably get a new PDU anyway and I think I'll end up installing a socket next to the cabinet or if I get a new cabinet I might get one with a cutout back so I could have the socket on the wall inside it but that's a future thing so for now I'm just going to cut this flex and just put a inline connector on it and then finally we can get this cabinet off the wall. Okay so there we go so I've just wired the connector onto the back of the PDU there and then the other one's down here just left it open so you can see it so yeah it's just a three pole connector used ferrules and stuff to get the flex in there nicely they're very similar to the GST18 connector, I think it is, that you get on those interlinked under-desk power supply, like power packs for offices and stuff. I don't know if it's the same thing, but they seem pretty neat. And the good thing is that they actually do lock together, so you can see this one up here has like a little locking tab and the other one's got a sort of corresponding one, so they actually lock together. And they're rated at 16 amps, which is way more than enough for this 13 amp PDU, so... Yeah, neat little solution just to allow me to take that out of the cabinet, and then when I put the cabinet back up, I can take that plate out the back, feed that up inside the cabinet, and connect it together again, so that works. And yeah, one day I'll get a new, um, put a socket behind here and probably get a new PDU as well, but this will do for now. So yeah, now that's all done, the next step is to get this cabinet off the wall. So it's a pretty almost momentous occasion because it's been up there for so long and it was such a significant project, but yep, time to take the cabinet out. I won't be able to do it on video just because there's no way I could fit in the space because I'll need to clear all the cameras and lights out the way to get out the, get out the cupboard, but you can see at the top there, there's two big big screws on the back. They hold the bracket to the wall. And there's a smaller screw in the middle. There's one there, one in the middle, and one at the side. 
So basically, if I take those smaller screws out, that unlocks it from the bracket, and then it just lifts off the bracket and comes out. So it's a pretty easy system to get in and out. So get the cabinet out, and then take that bracket off the wall and mount the new uh, Unistrut type metal, str metal strut work stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm talking nonsense, it's getting late, but yeah. Time to get this cabinet off the wall. And it's down. So that was a pretty dramatic thing, but yeah, that's all gone. So I've taken it down. And you can see that's the bracket. So for people who didn't see the original video, that's how it's mounted. There's this bracket that has four screw holes that mounts to the wall and then the cabinet kind of hooks over it and then you can secure it with some screws. So, yep, that's now there. All these keystone jacks came out the top really easily. I didn't even need to really wiggle them. I just lifted the cabinet down. They all came out naturally. So that definitely is a lot easier for future time they might need to take the rack down. And yeah, so that's there. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take that bracket off. I'll probably take the grippets out as well, just so the new stuff can fit flush, flush to the wall, because the grippets protrude maybe one mil from the wall. And then I'm going to mount the struts across. So first thing I'll just do is I'll get all that off, and then off camera I'll get these angle brackets in. I'll be basically putting one there, one on the other side, and then I'll do another strut sort of wherever the bottom of the cabinet is. The cabinet won't actually fix to that, but it'll just space it out from the wall correctly. I mean, I can maybe put a screw, th you know, drill a hole in the back of the cabinet to secure it, but it just sort of spaces it off the wall correctly. So, yep, time to get that bracket off, get the grippets out, and get these brackets installed. Okay, so a bit of an update. I've now got the brackets on the wall. So you can see there's two brackets up there. I've only put the top two screws in just now, just because I think if I put the bottom two screws in, it'll foul up me getting the channel in, or the strut in. So I'm going to put the top two in just now, get the strut in place, and then I'll do the bottom two. And yeah, they went in fine. Just drilled their eight M8, their M8 coach bolts. So I just drilled a thing a six mil, no, a five mil pilot hole on each side, and then they went in absolutely fine. They just used big washers just to kind of space it out because the hole in the bracket's quite big. So yeah, that all went fine. Totally strong, like that's not going anywhere. So what I now need to do is get this strut put in. What I think I'll also do is I'm gonna once it's in, it's got the slots in the back. I'm gonna put a screw through the strut into the stud that goes here vertically, just to kind of tie it in. Unfortunately, I can't use those big coach, coach bolts because I don't have a socket that's narrow enough to fit into this into this channel. They do sell ones designed for this, but they cost about 30 odd pounds, which isn't worth it for this. So what I think I'll do is I'll just use a sort of decently sized wood screw to go into the back there, and that'll be good enough just to tie it in. And then most of the weight will be taken by the coach bolts on the, on either side. So yeah, what I need to do is just get this channel or this strut in, and then we can fix it all in. So yep, it'll just kind of fit up in there like that and kind of go in like that with two screws through the front or two bolts through the front and then, yep, get that in there, get a screw, a wood screw into that stud at the back and then get the bottom two screws into the brackets on either side. And then we'll be halfway there. I'm not gonna finish this off tonight though. I'm just gonna get this in and then I'll do the other one tomorrow because cutting this was an absolute nightmare. So I looked at some stuff online that said, I'll oh, just use a junior hacksaw, that won't be too bad. And Turns out a junior hacksaw can cut it, but it took probably about half an hour, if not longer, to do that cut. It was an absolute nightmare. So I was able to get it done, but I'm going to wait until tomorrow to do the other one because, yeah, that was an absolute nightmare. I'm absolutely exhausted after it. So I've got one done now. I'll need to do the other one. And what I would say is if you're just doing, like, one cut with this, yeah, you can use a hacksaw. But if you're going to do anything more than that, you know, say you're actually building something quite substantial, you're going to want to get some sort of grinder or something like that to try and cut this down quickly because just using a hacksaw is an absolute nightmare. Admittedly, also this is the heavy duty one. They do it in two thicknesses. They do 1.5 mil and 2.5. 1.5 would probably been a lot quicker to cut and would have been absolutely fine for what I'm doing here. I think I was just looking at it going, you know, the price difference isn't that significant. May as well go for the heavy duty one. Totally not thinking that that then meant I had to cut it. So yeah, time to get this up, get the rest of the screws in and then we'll come back and we'll do the other one as well. Okay, so I'm back. And as you can see, I finally had the motivation to cut down the other one and I've got both struts installed. So yeah, that's in there. So you can see, if you look in the corner here, you can see there's the Zebedee or spring channel nut in the back there. And then we're just screwed through the front into that. I also put a big square washer in behind that lug that sticks out. That's just because there was a little gap here and I wanted this to be flush to the wall, not sitting proud of the wall just so I could screw it into the back. So putting that spacer in that square washer in there just spaced it out and then it sits totally flat against the wall. And there's that screw and washer that I put through the back there. It's not as good as using the big proper screw, but that's strong enough. It wouldn't take much weight, but it just gives it a little bit of extra strength. And yeah, these are absolutely not going anywhere. Like, you know, they're properly solid. Like, you don't even hear, like, the wall creaking or anything. Like, that is super strong. So yeah, dead happy with how strong those are. 
So yep, that's both of them in there. The next step is to get the rack mounted. So as you probably saw when I took the rack off, it just has a sort of bracket that goes along the top here and then the rack hangs on that and it doesn't actually fix onto this bottom one. This really will just space it out from the wall. So what I'm going to go and do is get the top bracket mounted up here, just a few screws through into the Zebedee nuts behind it. And once that's on, we can then get the cabinet up and get all these cables into it. Okay, so now I've got the bracket mounted, so you can see that's up there. Just goes into those four Zebedees at the back. And I've used more of those big 40mm square washers, just so it can the bracket can straddle the channel, because you can see where the screw holes in the bracket are. It sort of sits below the top of the channel and that would buckle. And even if that wasn't there, because the Zebedee nut's quite deep into the channel, this thin steel would probably end up bending. So I put those big square washers behind it just to spread the load out, and that's now really secure. So yeah, the cabinet will just hook onto that. And then what I've done down here is because the cabinet doesn't fix onto this, it just sits against it. The force from that cabinet is basically going to be pushing into this channel here and pushing it towards the wall. But because I've got these big square washers up here, if the cabinet rested against the channel directly, that then means it would kind of, it would, the bottom would be closer to the back wall than the top because it's spaced out a bit at the top and the cabinet would slope down slightly. I mean, we're only talking a couple of mil. So what I've done is I had these two offcuts from the end of the two channels, which are actually the perfect size. And I just basically hooked them into the channel like that, not even hooked in, but just like laid them into the channel like this. And that sits really well because it rests on both the top and the bottom and just sits in there really securely. And that gives maybe an extra couple of mil of thickness. So that means the bottom of the cabinet will be more or less level with the top. The only thing I had to do here is because of the way this sits in, it was fouling that screw that I put into the back stud, so I've just taken it out. It really won't be needed for this. I mean, in fact, we're talking like with this one, it's like it's actually me pushing this channel into the wall. So I've just taken that screw out there, put those two offcuts in, and that gives quite a secure sort of base for the bottom of the cabinet to sit against. So yeah, pretty happy with that. Now it's time to get that cabinet on the wall. And there we go, normality is restored. The cabinet's now back on the wall. And yeah, that was pretty good. Pretty easy to sort of just hook up there and fit it on. And that is a lot stronger. Even just from, my, from like a confidence perspective, when I was mounting it and finishing up and getting everything in there, I found myself kind of leaning on it a little bit and I had no worries about doing that. Whereas previously, if I was like working inside the cabinet, I found myself leaning on it at all, I'd always be a bit, oh, don't do that. It's not securely on the wall. So even just from a confidence perspective, I'm a lot more confident. And while I haven't like done a pull a full pull up on it because it's got quite a sharp edge and that could have gone very badly wrong, I have put a huge amount of my body weight on it, just pulling down on it. And yeah, there's no movement at all. You don't even hear any creaking in the wood or anything. So this is definitely a lot more secure than it used to be. So I'm very happy with it. So all I need to do now is get that patch panel in, then get the rest of the kit in. But I'll do the patch panel first just to kind of get that done, show how I've done that. Then we'll get the rest of the equipment in. Yep, so I'm just getting all these turned into the patch panel. And it's really giving me like advent calendar vibes because I've had to like search around for the right number and it's a bit fiddly. Oh, there, oh, there's one I was looking for. Um, so yeah, get there with it all. Just get all these into the patch panel, get it mounted, and we'll be good to go. Okay, so there we go. That's all the keystones now in there and then the DSL connection over there. And I've just zipped out all the cables to the back here. So that's perfectly well supported. And then these are done in pairs because there's only 24 lugs. That's perfectly secure. So now we can get this mounted. And yeah, I quite like the idea of a keystone patch panel. This one's a bit fiddly just because it's so dense, you have to kind of stack the ports. But especially for 24 ports, that would be a lot better than trying to use those IDC connectors. It's, just nice, it's nice to be able to like terminate them and then click them in rather than sort of try and punch down onto this while you're in a cabinet standing up a ladder. And yeah, it all went fine. The only issue was just this stupid RG11 module that I hate because obviously it's extra wide, than it's much wider than it needs to be. Oh, it's caught. I also had to cut the blank that's next to it down. Don't even be able to make that out. We had to like cut some slack off that, cut some of that blank off just to get it to fit. But it's in there and you don't really see from the front, it looks okay. So yeah, that is the patch panel ready. So all I need to do is mount it up here. And obviously there's a lot of slack back here. And because this is, this is all solid core cable, it's really stiff. So it's really hard to bend around in here. And obviously if I did have a huge loop, it would just stop, kept going back deep enough. But what's quite good here is there is enough space in the ceiling. So what I tend to do is there's enough slack to let me bring the cables down to here, terminate them, do all that sort of stuff. And then when I put the patch panel up, I can basically lose almost all the slack up into the ceiling. So that gets rid of it, which is good. And obviously all this, these zip ties, that's a strain relief. So I'm not worried about the cables pulling on the keystones or anything like that. So yeah, time to get this keystone, uh, well, the patch panel mounted and then get, well, everything else in. Oh, and also under here, I've also fed that power cable up through there so I can click, put the PDU in and then plug it into that. So that'll be pretty easy. But yeah, time to get everything put back in the rack. Okay, so there we go. That's patch panel now mounted. So 
Yeah, it's pretty neat up, neat up there. And it'll be really interesting to see how these the ports being aligned like this works. And then over there you can see we've got a DSL port which I still need to label. And yeah, speaking of labeling, obviously this patch panel didn't come labeled at all. That's just, yeah, it's a bit annoying, but equally the numbering if it had come labeled would have probably been 1 to 24, 25 to 48. So it wouldn't have actually lined up with what I want here. So I've printed off my own label. And this is quite a good trick I would say, is if you're trying to print off any sort of labels or anything like this, where the, the actual sizing is really precise, so you know you need to like line up with these exact ports, the label tool in Microsoft Word is really good. Because if you go into like this thing to create like address labels and stuff like that, things on the mailings tab, it asks you to pick the type of label you're using and you can pick like an Avery, whatever number, A4 paper sheet of labels or whatever. But you can press a button to create a custom label and put in dimensions. So that's all I did here. I created a custom label in Word with dimensions. It was like, you know, four mil high and something wide, like a tiny little thing. And then all that does is just generate a table in Word of the correct dimensions. So I did that, put the appropriate grid lines in, put the number in. To do the offset second row, I just copied that to the next line and just adjusted the spacing at the front of the margins just to move it along a little bit. Set the grid lines and then just set a very faint grey grid line around the outside so I knew where to cut. Print it out on a big A4 label. Stuck a bit of sellotape over the top just because this toner I use is really rubbish and wipes off super easily so I put a bit of sellotape to almost laminate it and then just cut it out with a Stanley knife and that gave me one nice big laminated label that I could stick on the patch panel. This trick also works really well for things like network ports if you've got like a Euro module that has a window to put the number in. A lot of the time, even when I see contractors putting them in, they'll just take a label maker and just stick a label across the front of the faceplate, which just looks rubbish. Whereas if you've got the actual little window, what you can do is if you get those, they usually have like a little bit of cardboard in them. And what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of cardboard out, measure it, create a sheet of labels in Word of that exact measurement, set super gr faint grey grid lines, put all the numbers in, print it out and just cut it out with scissors. And it just gives like the perfect size little bits, bits of paper, bits of card to stick in the network ports. And it looks really good. So yeah, a bit of an aside there, but that's how I've labelled this, and that's a tip I would use for labelling Euro modules because, yeah, sticking label maker tape across the front looks rubbish, so actually doing that does make a big difference. But yeah, that's all mounted there. So yeah, now time to get all the rest of the equipment in and finally get my network back because currently, yeah, my network is, um, let's just say it's a bit of a pile of stuff sitting on top of some folding chairs. I've been able to get my UDM access point and modem put in just to get some sort of connectivity, but obviously none of the wired stuff's working right now, so yeah. Be good to get all this back up in the cabinet.
and there we go, it's now complete. So we've got all the new equipment in here, we open it up, see it, that's all there. And it's the exact same stuff as you've always seen, patch panel up there, just a new one, but we've now got the new DSL port in the corner there, so I can use the normal RG11 cables to connect the modem up. It's also a bit better from like a you know, self-documenting perspective, you know, you can't accidentally plug the wrong thing into that because it's physically a different connector. Same PoE injectors I've used before, my old Unify switch I've had for years, UDM Pro I made a video about previously, CloudKey Gen 2 Plus which is acting as the NVR for Unify Protect. If you're interested in why I'm still using a separate CloudKey instead of using the UDM, watch the UDM video, I'll talk about it there. Switch here, this is coming in a future video, it's a pretty weird thing I'm doing with it but that's a surprise for a future video if I ever get around to making it. And here we have my OpenReach modem. PDU down the bottom as before, and yeah, that's all installed. So we can now turn it all on, so if I turn this on, let's put power in the rack and then turn this on. Hopefully this all fires up and works properly the first time, I've connected it all up right. There we go. That's all starting up. So yeah, that's all starting up there, just need to go and check it all works. And I'll come back and talk about my final thoughts for this all. Okay, so that's it done. So the cabinet's all now in there, we can open it up. It's now been a, it's like a good few weeks later, so it's still on the wall, it's not fallen off yet, which is good. And yep, there you can see, all the cables are now in. I'm definitely so much more confident now it's mounted like this. I've, I've now not got any fear of this coming off the wall. I can pull on it, I can put weight on it, I don't worry about it now, which is great. Another thing I noticed with this mounting is that, as I mentioned in the vid video earlier, that I put that additional bit of the, the excess channel down the back there to ensure that this bottom is spaced off the same as the top to keep the cabinet level. And that has worked amazingly well. So if we take the door here, this door swings really freely, like there's you know, no resistance on that at all. But I can actually position that door to anywhere and it just stays in position. I can just open it and leave it in whatever position I want it to be in and it'll just stay there. Whereas previously with the, the old mounting, even that, which is quite flat to the wall, if you open the door and unlocked it, it would just slowly swing open because the cabinet was tilting down. And likewise, if the bottom of the cabinet was tilting up, the door would just swing shut. So this is so level, so you know precise, that door just doesn't swing at all. It just stays perfectly in position, which is actually quite impressive. And now as for this patch panel idea, you know, left lining all the ports, I quite like it. It's definitely not for everywhere, like not every environment would probably benefit from this. And it's maybe a little bit fiddlier to get the ports in and out of the patch panel. But from like the overall like appearance of it, I much prefer it because the cables are all now kind of, kind of like a uniform length. They're no longer sort of all bunched up at the right hand side. This could probably look even better because these cables I've used are all the old ones I had previously. So they've previously been bent into a different shape and then they had to like stretch out to this. At first it looked really rubbish, but after letting it settle for a while and putting a Velcro tie around it, it looks a lot better. But what I'm really tempted to do in the future is replace these with those like slim run cables, the much thinner ones. I'll probably do a future video on that and see how that looks. Because if, that, if these were even thinner, that would look even better. You'll see the DSL port up there. That's working absolutely fine. And because I know people will comment and this will be a good sign to see people who have watched the video with, with it before commenting and the people who have just commented without actually watching the video. Yes, I will probably replace this at some point with like a twisted pair Cat5 type RJ11 cable. This is just a cheap one it comes with, it's just like a flat cable. And to be honest, I've never had a problem with them. They've always generally worked fine, I mean it's a very short length. But anytime I show one in a video, people inevitably complain in the comments that it's not a twisted pair. So I'll probably end up getting a twisted pair version of this in the future, but I've just not done it yet. But yeah, that's all installed there. Definitely a very fun experience. I've discovered the yeah, Unistrut or Unistrut type channel stuff is absolutely fantastic. That is so strong. It is a pain to cut down, but I probably will end up using this in the future. I've, I've got a cupboard that I need to kit out with better shelving because the current shelving is about to collapse. And I might actually end up using this for it because it does work really well. So yeah, it's definitely a really good way to mount it all on the wall. And that new patch panel is definitely a nice little upgrade. So yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for watching.